Hello and welcome back to Talking About Maya. This is uh, video number five in the MASH pseudo tutorial series. Uh, today we're going to be going over uh, some strength maps and follow up objects, as well as the visibility node. Uh, we'll also touch on ramps again, which was, I believe, back in. I think the distribution or the repro instancer. I don't know. I'll, I'll have it in the, in the doobly doo below. Um, which video that was referenced in originally, because we're only going to tangentially cover it today. So, I believe that would be that's not supposed to be there, but I'm sure they'll go away quickly. <laughs> All right, so uh, with that in mind, let's go ahead and start creating some setups. I believe we're just going to go with some simple cubes for this example to begin with. Create a mash network. This is going to be fall. No, let's not fall into that trap again. Cubes galore mash. All right. I don't know why it doesn't update properly, so we'll just drag it out. So we now have our waiter again. I believe we're going to go to our distribution tab and create a, a grid, since a grid is going to be fairly simple. I'm going to set this to about 50. And we will set this to about 45. Give ourselves a nice distribution to illustrate a few points. So what we're going to do is we're going to quickly create a visibility node. And what this does is it sort of affects the way that objects are displayed. So in this example, we're going to create a fall off object. Now, by default, it creates sort of this sphere, spheroid, uh, gyroscope looking deal. So. We have some objects now, or some, some options now, rather. We can invert the fall off so that it creates holes wherever we bring it. Very nice, very nice. We can keep it normal. Uh, we can change it to an add mode, which when you invert, doesn't really do anything. Uh, a remove mode, which seems to break the whole thing, but we'll keep it normal. Uh, I'm sure if I figure out some other use cases for it, we'll return to that. Now, the inner zone is this interesting concept. It sort of affects the amount of... Speaking broadly about fall-off objects now, if you're affecting how, like, the randomness of a rotation, which I'll show you in a few minutes, um, the inner zone is sort of representing full strength. So if we could somehow uh, be channeling the fall off of the object's visibility instead of on off if it was a like transparency control it would be fully transparent inside this inner zone and it would be fully opaque outside of this outside reach right here so with that in mind your inner zone does have some impact if it's 100% the entire object is affecting visibility. Uh, the outer reach then becomes 100% visible. Uh, otherwise, you have this sort of uh, gradation between the two zones, where it's sort of almost 100%, not quite. And that'll become more apparent when we rotate these guys. So uh, that was just to illustrate that a falloff object can be inverted to uh, achieve certain effects so instead of having this on a uh, visibility node which we are going to delete now and we will subsequently destroy this fall off object let's go ahead and add a random node and create a fall off object for that so now by default anything inside the, the uh, reaches of this object are randomized and everything else is normal. If we increase the inner zone, the amount of randomness changes. So at the very center, everything is fully randomized. And as you create the inner zone all the way out, you notice that there's no longer a gradation, so to speak, of randomness. Whereas with a zero, it's like a ramp of randomness, basically. And this would work in 3D space, but I'm just using a grid to illustrate the effect a little more normally, uh, a little more visually simply. 
so to speak. So let's put this back to 0.5, which is basically a 50% effect rate in the center. You can see as we move it around, randomness is applied dynamically. You can also scale up this fall off object so that the, uh, the gradation can be across a greater range of uh, space. Uh, don't do that. I believe you can also rotate it, which is useful if you were to squeeze it like that and then rotate it. You can sort of <laughs> get this uh, pulsating of randomness effect. So you can do quite a few things with this fall off object. Um, I believe you can go to its channel box and change these different settings here as well. So uh, moving back here. I believe I want to show off the rotation randomness, like I was saying, and we'll turn off all positional randomness. So the only thing that the fall off object is now affecting is the random rotations. So here in the center, it's very random. Out near the edges, it's beginning to become random. And as we move it around, they randomly uh, rotate. If we decrease the center area, more of the um, more of the objects will be in motion as we move it around, as that inner zone is a lot smaller now, meaning that only this very center of, of objects stays fully rotated, whereas all these other objects are kind of rotating in relation to it. Oops, uh, that was not the way I wanted it. Kind of beating a dead horse here at this point, but uh, again, dealing with ramps, uh, this is the tangential ramp discussion I was going to talk about. You can affect, I'm going to put these both to a spline uh, tangent type, so that when I create a new one in here, it's also spline. Uh, one thing you can do, basically it's going from 100% in the fall off zone, or the inner zone, to 0% at the edge of the fall off object, you can make it way, like you can make it very strongly affect all the way right to the edge or vice versa. You can affect just barely anything at the very outside edge. So you get this kind of slower, more gradual randomization happening. Um, this might be useful for you know, any number of tasks where you need that sort of thing. Um, and as always, you can make multiple points. You can have a spike uh, randomization just outside of the fallout, fall off zone. You can have it become sort of this uh, very, very specific area of effect, right? Uh, which you can then uh, make smaller and smaller. And you can see that nowhere in the center is fully normalized, but it's not quite random either. It's, it's this kind of cool effect. So yeah, ramps are really cool to play with in that regard. Um, ramps across the board in MASH are useful in editing the way an attribute is applied to the MASH network. Uh, so anywhere that you see a ramp, if you can affect it and like have an effect on the objects, then that's the, the way it's, it's working, is from a zero is, a, is on a percentage scale, how much it's being applied, so to speak. Okay, so that covers fall off objects in a very simple way. Uh, we'll be using them in future projects, worry not. I think we should go on to strength maps though. So let's go ahead and turn this mash network off, grab ourselves a cube, scale it way up, go into the inputs for its creation, and create ourselves some divisions. So. Let's make that a little smaller, kind of like that. Okay. How do we want to represent the surface of this object? I think, let's look at our polygon primitives. How about helixes? Let's, let's simplify these geometries a bit. So subdivision axes, let's say two, three, four. Four seems good. 25 seems like the minimum. 
Uh, let's push it down to 12. Oh, 12 still works. Okay. Very cool. Very cool. So we will do the thing that we've been doing before, which is bringing down the pivot point to the very bottom of the object, um, establishing it as the center, as, as the kind of the baseline. I think we will push that down a little bit and then group it. So this will be kind of just kissing the surface of our sphere. Take it back out of isolation mode, put it here so we can kind of uh, scale this so that it's appropriate for the face values. And now let's create a new mesh network. So this is going to be the world mesh. So automatically gives us linear distribution, which we do not like. We want to have a mesh distribution with face center, flood the mesh, and we'll take our sphere and use it in our input mesh. Suddenly we have how many how many points? We have 10,000 points. Wonderful. Always making my day with that. Uh, you can see that our, our spheres are not actually poking through the surface very well, are they? Let's see if we can fix that. No? Oh, you know what we did. You know what we did. We, uh, we instanced the objects itself instead of the... So, quick fix. We will... We've still got our world mesh. I'm going to open up the repro mesh and drag that group into it. So in a second or two, this will pop up with all our helixes, hopefully properly applied. Does not seem to be happening, though. Hmm. Hmm. Right, right, right. Let's grab our sphere again. I forgot that I undid a bunch of times, so. My bad on that one. And we'll flood our mesh. That's a little better. Can we, can we fix that? Oh, good. Okay. This is kind of the same effect as pushing along normals. Uh, it appears that is good enough for me. Okay, uh, let's go back to the distribution type under face settings, and I want to enable scaling. <laughs> let's go ahead and uh, increase the size of these guys. Let's see, so I want the helix to increase in size. Whoa, 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 whoa. Can we get somewhere in between? It's rough when you have to apply effects like this over time. So I think what we're going to do is grab our world mesh and convert it to a, an instancer. And apparently break it. <laughs> it is there. World mesh. Distribution. Well, let's let's just start over. That that did not go well. So we will grab our group, create an instancer. This is the world mesh. Once again, we'll go back to the distribution, go to mesh, face center, flood mesh, and drag our sphere into it. Really helps if you actually, you know, configure it to the right spot. Hello? Hmm. Oh, how interesting. So you can hide your group, but you can't hide your original object and have this work. That's a little frustrating. Let's see. I think instead of trying to affect that, we're going to take our distribution and we're going to push along normals just to get them a little bit closer to where we want them. Oh, I see they already were pretty close. Okay. Um, once again, we will enable scaling, which we now need to fix with the group. And we can actually kind of see it happening live now that we have the instancer as our, now that we have instanced objects as opposed to um, a, a mesh object, repo mesh. So what, what did we go through all this effort for? Well, 
you might have gotten an indication from the world mash name that we are going to make this a globe, so to speak. So let's create a visibility node, going over to that guy again. And we're going to talk about strength maps now. This is very similar in concept to the falloff object. Now, the falloff object worked on percentages of applied um, attributes. Uh, in the case of visibility, uh, zero or one, either on or off whether this object is going to be shown or not. Um, and so if you have a black and white image, you can use that to um, kind of texturally apply visibility. So let's, let's, let's just run through it. Um, so instead of having an object that you can move around, you're going to use a texture on this object to apply visibility or any other effect that you want. So in the strength map, you can click this checkerboard and we're going to select a file where I will go into a, a pre-existing file that I have. I know, kind of cheating. And you'll notice it's kind of all hibbledy-dibbledy on its side and weirdness. So we're going to go back to this visibility in the strength map area. You can see here is a map helper where we can drag our sphere. And what we're going to do with that, you can see this map projection change to UV. So instead of Y, it goes to UV. And now we're using the Spheres UV map to apply the black and white image that we just supplied as our strength map. And now you can see we basically have the globe. Here's you know North America and Africa and all that good stuff. So even Antarctica down here. So cute. Uh, let's see, what do we want to do with this? I mean, now that we're here, what do we, what do, we do? What do we do? <laughs> uh, well, I think that's actually all I had for that. Um, I didn't expect it to go so fast. I guess we'll talk about this to a degree. Um, so once again, the uh, visibility has some strength associated with it. Uh, the step acts kind of like every other stepping attribute. It's the percentage of the object that it is applied to. So it's kind of weird. It's it could be useful, um, especially with like a wiping effect, like going from nothing applied to the whole thing applied in the in a horse in a vertically rising fashion. Kind of strange, but uh, you can also change the randomness of how the strength map is applied, and instead of having a fully on or off situation, you can have sort of this uh, scatterbrained effect here and you can keep it higher or lower and you can kind of play around with that and it's nice to have it but i think most of the time you're going to want to keep it at you know one or zero um unless you want that slightly sparser effect yeah so if you change this back to y you can change its its various axis of projection typically you will get the best bang for your buck by using a uv map with it Woo! Of course, you could always get, you know, <laughs> another fall off object and just say, whatever, dude, I just want this strength map applied in certain areas on this <laughs> thing. Oh boy. And then you could just play around with having that applied dynamically, like so. No. I don't think that's what we want to do, though. <laughs> So why don't we go ahead and apply a favorite material to these guys? Why don't we go with a incandescent bulb? Seems like a poor choice. Let's give it a shot. There we go. Always hide and unhide when using an instancer. All right, let's start framing things up. Grab our render view, put a light in, because I always forget to put a light in. Grab our sky dome, give it some extra samples. Do let's take this intensity down a schmiddle, let's say to 0.5. Let's see what that looks like in Arnold. Oh, dude! Oh, I like that. I I know I just gave away how Californian I am. Oh, that's so cool. Oh, I like that. Oh, I like that a lot. 
that may make me a little bit too happy. Um, go to our hyper shader real quick. So shader glow, I'm assuming. Apologies, oh, didn't want to subject you to that cough. I'm assuming that with Arnold, the incandescent is coming from the shader glow. So if we do exponential, no. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, let's see. Star points, rotation, glow attributes, glow color, glow intensity. I really thought that was going to be the thing to change it. Bummer. Or did it update just now? It doesn't seem to be doing anything, honestly. Huh. We'll have to look into this. Maybe we'll go over some incandescent stuff later. But for now, I think we deserve to take a nice little render of this. So let's uh, let's get ourselves up to 1080p. And let's check our default light set here. It seems that's the only one, so that works. I think we'll take a lovely view of North America. Hopefully that works out well. Take a quick render view just so I don't have to cheat. What do you think? Is that working for you compositionally? I think that's what we're going to have to work with, so let's take our little render. So as usual, at the end of this video, we're going to be talking a little bit about um, what we went over. So we went over some strength maps, which are black and white images that affect how attributes from each node are, are applied. So in this case, we took a texture of the world map, applied it to our visibility node, which we then had to tell, give it some UV sets to properly apply them. And that uh, turned off all the spirals that we didn't want to be representing the world, and it gave us a nice globe. Uh, before that, we talked about fall-off objects. These are kind of interesting uh, spherical-shaped objects that you can create that um, dynamically affect whether a an attribute is applied or not. Yeah, I like this little thing. And you can play around with all those different settings of how it's shaped and how, how the inner, radi inner, uh, inner radius thing affects it. Sorry, losing my mind here. And we also went over, what was that? A little bit over ramps and the visibility node. So some good stuff today. However, I, uh, I sort of just realized something. I didn't talk about meshes with fall off objects. So let's say I want a torus to be my fall off object, a little, little bonus section here that should have been in the original one. And I want my randomness to be affected by that. So if I connect it to my torus, no, okay. So in that case, we have to create a fall off object. And in our fall off object, we can actually have either a sphere, a cube, which looks like this, a NURBS curve, which you would have to draw yourself, particles, which we're not going to go over, or a mesh, which we can then go to connections down here, drag our torus in. If we hide our torus, oh gosh, we can still see the effects of it being applied donutly to our grid of randomized items. Uh, same thing applies as did to um, to our to our mesh fall off as it did to our regular fall off object. You can rotate it and have it affect differently shape wise. You can scale it to give different effects, right? Uh, you can translate it willy nilly. Now some of the drawbacks of using this technique include the inner zone is not really effective. <laughs> um, so you would have to certainly play with 
with these ramps in order for anything to really uh, be effective here. It's sort of a, a shame because it's using meshes for this seems like such a cool idea, right? Um, but you can never get the inner zone to be quite small enough. Maybe maybe playing with the modes will do it. Um, but I mean, it doesn't it doesn't seem to be working right. So I would say that if you're going to use a mesh, expect some limitations on the uh, percentage applied. So I mean, it's it's maybe if you invert it. <laughs> I don't know. But I think it's awfully cool that you even have the option to uh, get a torus effect as your falloff object without having to work very hard for it, you know? And you can do this with anything else that's got holes in it that you model yourself. You're not limited to primitives or anything, so. Anywho, that was the kind of end, end title to this whole thing, so. <laughs> Thanks for watching this far. Uh, I hope you learned something today. If you have any suggestions for MASH projects you'd like to see done, let me know in the comments below or email me at the supplied email in the doobly-doo. Until next time, thanks for watching. Bye-bye!